So, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Shirley Graham, and I'm the director of the Gender Equality Initiative in International Affairs here at the Elliott School. Um, I also teach three courses, Gender, War and Peace, Global Gender Policy and Women in Global Politics. I'm delighted to be joined here today by my um, colleague, Dr. Michael Brown, um, who is a highly esteemed academic and professor at the school and has also recently joined the Gender Equality Initiative. Um, last fall, uh, Dr. Brown taught for the first time a new course called Gender and Security. And um, today we're going to be sharing some of what we learned from um, this particular course that was taught last fall, but also our collective experience of teaching on gender in international affairs, why we teach this topic, why we think it's important, what we're learning as we go through this process, what are some of the you know, key issues on the global agenda, and how do we want to engage all of you in this process of either teaching or learning and um, acquiring knowledge um, and developing new knowledge on this very important topic. So I'm really excited because I can see lots of friends, lots of former students, lots of current students, colleagues here today. And it really is wonderful to have your support and to know that you are so interested in this topic. So just to kind of share how we're going to frame our conversation today. Originally, when we thought about having this event, I was going to interview Mike, particularly around his new book, which I'm just going to give a shameless plug for here, um, Gender and the Security Agenda Strategies for the 21st Century. So there was a, a launch of this book last fall, but it really has um, been crucial for the creation of this new course, Gender and Security. And then we thought it would be interesting just to kind of broaden out the conversation and talk about the teaching of gender and international affairs at the Elliott School. Um, and to have a, open up a conversation or the beginnings of hopefully a number of conversations about this very important topic. So what we decided to do instead is we would kind of bat a couple of questions back and forth between the two of us. And then we will open up to all of you to ask any questions that you may have or any comments or any ideas or suggestions about how we can raise awareness of this topic and really institutionalize um, the, the, the subject within the Elliott School, um, but also, you know, broaden awareness around these key substantive issues that we're going to be talking about today. So we thought it would be interesting for you all to hear how we got involved in this topic in the first place. What was it that whet our appetites and that really fostered our curiosity in this whole topic of gender and international affairs? So I'm going to love the ball to um, Michael Brown first and ask him that particular question. So, Mike, when did you get interested in this topic? What was it that piqued your curiosity and then that really encouraged you to keep going with your research in this area? Shirley, thanks very much. And uh, I have to say, uh, for me, it's, it's interesting to be here. And just to put this in context, in the uh, US presidential campaign in 1992, a third party candidate, Ross Perot, got enough support to get into the presidential debate. And that meant that his vice presidential running mate, Admiral James Stockdale, got into the vice presidential debate. Uh, Stockdale had a distinguished military career, but he was just completely unknown to the general public. And so at the debate, when he was asked to make his opening statement, he started off by saying, who am I? Why am I here? And I have to admit, I'm having a James Stockdale kind of experience, because if you had asked me 20 years ago, 10 years ago, or even five years ago, to be on a panel about teaching gender and international affairs, I would have suggested that you had the wrong person. Uh, so for many decades, I've been introducing myself as a security studies guy because I'm in the security studies field. And um, as you know, that's you know, historically been a male dominated field. 
And I first got interested in security issues as an undergraduate uh, in the 1970s when I learned that the Soviet Union had 12,000 nuclear weapons aimed at me. And so my first interest, that, um, and it lasted for some 15 years, was the nuclear arms race and the possibility of global thermonuclear war, which you know, would have posed an existential threat to humanity. And I thought that working on an important issue like that was something that was worthwhile to spend one's time on. Uh, and you know, then the Cold War came to an end around 1990, and um, I was getting tired and a little depressed studying nuclear weapons, so I shifted over to ethnic conflict. And that was an important issue to study in the 1990s because ethnic conflict and civil war was the most common form of armed conflict in the world, and it was an issue that had not gotten much attention in previous eras and seemed to be worthy of attention. And so I, I guess if there's been one strategic principle behind my research, it's to try to focus on important issues. And over the past 20 years, I've become more and more aware of how important gender issues are in the security agenda, in the security agenda very broadly defined to include human security, uh, and of course in human affairs more generally. And it, just in my own experience, um, you know, it's been a lot of my work on the administrative side of things that has operationalized a lot of this. I, I was running a master's program in security studies at another university and I was brought in to fix it. And, one of the things I noticed when I arrived was that there were 30 people teaching in the program, um, full-time and part-time, and one woman, uh, one out of 30. And um, you know, my reaction to that is, you know, what's wrong with this picture? And when I left five years later, we had 60 people teaching in the program, and 20 of them were women. We were not at 50-50, but we had made progress, and it didn't happen on its own. And uh, you know, during my time as dean at the Elliott School, we prioritized um, women in international affairs. We launched a speaker series featuring distinguished women in international affairs. And uh, with Barbara Miller, we launched the Gender Policy Program, which became the program that you're running today. And so on the academic front, and then you know, eventually in terms of my own research, this has become a priority. And I've come to appreciate that Gender is essential to understanding the traditional security studies issues, armed conflict, as well as the broader human security agenda. And, uh, and that's, that's where we are today. So, um, so let me ask the, the same question of you. You're from a younger generation of scholars, but you're more of a grizzled veteran when it comes to gender issues. And so how did you get started on gender uh, priorities? Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm not sure I'm from that much younger generation of scholars, but um, I'll take it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I when I went to Dublin City University to do my master's degree in international affairs, I'd already spent nearly 20 years in business. And um, so I had worked in the private sector beforehand. I, I don't have a sort of a you know, um, some sort of a, a linear progression in terms of my career. This was um, very much a trajectory for me to um, move on from doing my master's degree into a PhD program um, and then working full time in academia. But when I started my master's degree program, um, I was obviously very excited. And I noticed that I was nearly always the only person in the class going, and what about women? Or, you know, and where does gender come into this? And very often it was met, that question was met with sort of, you know, maybe sniggers from my fellow students. Sometimes it just wasn't, you know, seen as such a weighty or important topic. It was even some of my professors were, you know, clearly, you know, a bit taken aback that I was even asking these questions. 
Um, now, this is, you know, early 2000s. I'm not talking about, you know, way back when. And it just really struck me how fascinating it was that whenever I spoke about 50% of the population, whenever I brought women in, that that just wasn't really seen to be as serious a topic as some of the other topics that we were studying. So when I became more curious then about feminist research methodologies and taking a feminist approach to my own work in my master's degree, I got very excited about looking at these systemic and structural um, inequalities, gender inequalities and power imbalances and thinking through how they were impacting the production and reproduction of gender within institutions themselves, whatever those particular institutions may be. And so um, it fascinated me and I decided I would do my thesis um, research on UN Security Council Resolution 1325 which probably most of us or many of us are aware of, which was the first um, Security Council resolution and that created the Women, Peace and Security framework, uh, policy framework um, and agenda. And, and I think on a personal level, for me, studying feminist theory and feminist um, methodologies was exciting as a woman because it, it really forced me to question how I had internalized patriarchal values and norms and expectations around my own gender role and my own gender performance. And it also gave me a new perspective on my experiences, particularly I'm talking about marginalization experiences, experiences of discrimination and realizing I wasn't alone, that this wasn't something to do with me personally, that this was part of a systemic problem, not only where I was situated, but globally. And actually, even though on the one hand, that was, you know, um, you know, deeply uncomfortable, um, and uh, it was also comforting on another level, because I realized this systemic context in which I was situated and that really helped me to evolve myself as a woman and to really step into my own power and I know we bandy these sorts of terms around but it really did make a difference to me in terms of thinking about my own capacities and what I could do professionally in my own life so very exciting um, for me to discover this whole um, this whole subject and this whole topic. And it really was life changing for me. But we'll get on to that more in a moment. But in terms of, um, Mike, I want to ask you more now about your specific areas that you're focused on, that you, you know, that you want to just elevate in this conversation that you think need to be urgently responded to at this time. Well, there, there are a couple of things. Uh, I, I'm still primarily focused on the security studies field and the security studies agenda in my own research. I mean, I, I've become more and more of a generalist over the years, uh, just in part because of my professional work with journals where you have to read widely on a lot of different topics and running a master's program in security studies, you have to think about a lot of issues outside of your own area. And then the dean of the Elliott School, there were you know, literally dozens of courses on dozens of topics that I hadn't really thought about before. And the Elliott School is a multidisciplinary school. And so you know, that tends to broaden one's horizons. But in terms of my own research, I'm still focused on security issues. And you know, one of the things that we, found in our book, which, you know, as I said, looks at a wide range of traditional and non-traditional security areas. Um, it, it was really striking the, the commonalities. And I think this gets to the, the point you were just making about how there are some you know, fundamental issues here that we need to focus on. And the fundamental issues have to do with gender power structures and hierarchies and patriarchy. Um, and these are terms that are just not part of the normal security studies vocabulary and they should be 
uh, and you know, continuing to explore that, I think, has to be a priority. And I, I think you know, feminist scholars will not be surprised to hear that there are commonalities across issue areas, across regions, and over time, uh, feminist and gender scholars understand that. Uh, but I think there is a tendency for us to become narrow and specialized in our own research. That's kind of common in the academic world. Uh, the policy world is very stovepiped. And so I think it's important for us to point out that there are these structural, fundamental um, forces at work that we need to understand. And so in terms of my own work, um, you know, Chantal and I edited this first book, and uh, we're now working on a co-authored book focused on men masculinity and international security. And you know, I, I think one of the things that's important for us all to remember is, and again, I mean, you know this, and almost everybody here today knows this, but you know, the terms women and gender are not interchangeable. Um, they often are in common discourse. And I was a little annoyed the other day reading about the Biden administration's new gender policy council because they were talking almost entirely about women. And of course, you have to focus on women, but you have to include men and boys and you have to include LGBTQ people and priorities as well. And I think getting that balance right is important. And in terms of the security studies field, there's just very little written on men and masculinities. And we think that's an area that needs to be emphasized more. And of course, we have to continue to focus on women and girls and um, advancing those issues and our understanding of those issues as well. But there's a lot of work to be done on men and masculinities. And I, I think in gender studies in general, it's important to integrate that and highlight that more as um, an important thing to have on the agenda in the years ahead. And in terms of your own work, Shirley, what, what are you focusing on now and planning for the future? So I have um, historically focused on gender and UN peacekeeping, specifically looking at the incorporation inclusion of women into UN peacekeeping missions. Women have always been underrepresented in these missions, moving from only 1% of all personnel in the year 2000 to 5.5% in terms of military personnel, 15.1% in terms of military police. So the numbers have been increasing, but they're still very, very small. And it's important that we do have women within UN peacekeeping. They're, they're important for so many different reasons in terms of being able to um, sensitively, you know, culturally sensitively search women at checkpoints um, and border patrols um, involved in countering violent extremism, gathering, you know, data and intelligence from communities particularly where women, due to religious and cultural norms, cannot speak to males outside of their family or community and definitely cannot speak to, to, to men peacekeepers. So there are many reasons why it's important to include women, but we have all these barriers, all these um, structural military barriers in terms of, um, you know, again, the cultural norms within militaries and how women are perceived um, within those institutions that are obviously highly masculinized. And then, you know, how women can be promoted or retained within those institutions, um, particularly if there are barriers to them deploying to missions where they, you know, where they get the necessary um, opportunity to practice their skills, especially with militaries like the Irish Defence Forces, for example, and many defence forces, where they really don't have any other function other than, you know, um, peacekeeping or in terms of um, potentially, you know, patrolling their own borders, as was the case um, when there were the troubles in Northern Ireland. Um, so women and peacekeeping and also a, a new uh, piece of research on uh, gender advisors in militaries and particularly in relation to security cooperations. Uh, working in places like Afghanistan, Niger, and Iraq. And 
working with local women and local cultures to encourage local women to join those defense forces. And again, looking at the barriers domestically within those contexts and also within those military institutions to women's ability to join and also to be promoted and to be retained. Because obviously we have issues like sexual harassment and assault. We have issues like, for example, gender segregated accommodation facilities. We have other kind of deeper structural issues like protective discourses that make it very difficult for women to be seen in certain contexts as protectors in their own right and not as victims or not as the people who need to be protected. So these are some more of the kind of complexities that we obviously bring into our research. But I think broadly the whole topic of gender-based violence is um, really uh, paramount and um, urgent um, at the moment amongst many others. And I know there's many experts on this call and we all have particular areas of focus. But simply the fact that one in, one in three women will experience physical or sexual violence in her lifetime, and most of that will be at the hands of an intimate partner, is really a shocking statistic. It's a statistic we've been aware of for a long time. It gets bandied about a lot. But when you think about that, how normalized this type of violence has become in society, where it often isn't even talked about, most women never report their experience of violence, even to family or friends, never mind to the police, never mind to, uh, you know, refuges or helplines. So this whole issue of violence and how it ripples out across society, the impact it has on women parliamentarians, for example, in a recent study, 85% of women politicians said that they had experienced um, harassment on most of it online, much of it death threats, not only to themselves, but also to their families. Um, and these sorts of, uh, you know, attacks on women more broadly in society has a very insidious effect, such as it will silence some women. It will stop many women from uh, taking on some of these high profile public roles because of fear of attack of themselves or their families. And still women do come out and they are incredible human rights defenders. I had the great privilege last year of meeting some of them when the US State Department brought 10 women of courage to the Elliott School. And I, I'm just mentioning this because one particular woman I've been thinking about lately because we're coming up to the anniversary of a year ago when I met her for the first time, and her, her name is uh, Zarifa Jafari, and she is the first woman mayor in uh, Wardak province in Afghanistan. And she's a young woman, she's only 29 years of age, but because she took up this role that was politically and socially powerful um, in a part of Afghanistan that is still very deeply conservative, um, the Taliban actually attacked her and they burnt her hands. And I remember her showing me, in fact, she didn't even show me her hands. She was handing me a little vial of saffron as a gift, as a parting gift. And when I commented on her hands, she told me that she'd experienced many death threats and that she didn't expect to live for, you know, she didn't, she didn't know if she was going to live a full life because of the fact that she was in this role. So women like her are doing incredible work in this area. And, um, and, and I suppose I just want to talk about and just highlight to everybody here, they're doing it within these contexts of often living under this constant threat um, of violence or of death. Um, and yet they and yet they continue. And I think that courage needs to be needs to be commented on so uh, i'm just going to leave that piece there there is more that we could talk about in in the q a but i'm going to segue now into talking about teaching and what was it like um for you um teaching gender insecurity um, last fall 
And what did you notice was different about teaching a course on gender, perhaps, to how you had taught some of your other courses? Did you notice anything different in the classroom or the dynamic among students or how they engaged with the topic? Yeah, well, thanks. Um, I, I've been uh, teaching about gender in uh, two different settings. And so um, starting about five years ago, when I was getting back into the classroom, I started off by teaching uh, a couple of the school's survey courses, the Introduction to International Affairs course for freshmen, it's about 250 students per semester, and the International Security core course for the Security Studies program. And then of course, you know, this past fall, I started to teach a specialized course on gender and security. And I started to integrate gender into my survey courses right at the outset. And you know, of course, I did what professors always do. You take a look at the syllabi that had been used in the past. And um, I found that although gender had been mentioned from time to time in the freshman course, um, there were many iterations of the course, especially farther back in the past when gender wasn't really talked about at all. And the approach was to talk about the three classic political science theories of international relations, realism, liberalism, and constructivism, and feminism didn't get mentioned. And I, I guess in my own thinking about this, I mean, there's sort of gender 0, 0.0 where there's just no mention of it at all. Um, and then I think a lot of professors adopt what I call the gender 1.0 version, where there's one class or one guest lecture on gender and it's you know touched on at some point during the course, but it's just in passing and it's not really integrated into the course. And I've I tr I've tried to adopt more of a gender 2.0 perspective where it really is integrated and mainstreamed. And that doesn't mean that we talk about it every hour of every week, but I've tried to make sure that it's featured. And so I include feminism and gender theory as a theoretical approach for thinking about international affairs and international security. And you know, gender comes up again and again. If you're talking about the causes of armed conflict, Valerie Hudson has written a landmark study on that with her colleagues, Mary Caprioli and, and others. Um, conflict related sexual violence, if you're talking about economic development, climate change, um, gender is central to understanding all of those issues. And I, I think by mainstreaming gender and touching on it again and again and integrating it over the course of the semester uh, it's being featured i think the way it should be featured and really being woven into the fabric of thinking about these issues and uh, at the LA school more than half of our students are women and um, i found that our female students in particular were very pleased to see that this was being featured in the core courses and a lot of men as well because it's just something that had not been done in many courses in the past and as far as the gender and security course goes um I mean, frankly it was just fantastic and um you know uh I, I know i've said this to you before but let me just say publicly that i've never had a better group of students and i've been teaching for 40 years. I've never had a better group of students. Um, they were excellent and enthusiastic. I mean, they were excellent in terms of their training. I think thanks to the coursework they've done with you and the, the Gender Equality Initiative program and for our MA students, they've also taken some undergraduate courses. And their enthusiasm was just off the charts. And you know, keep in mind, I used to teach courses on nuclear arms control where students took the subject pretty seriously. But uh, the enthusiasm uh, of the students last semester, and again, this semester of teaching at the undergraduate level is remarkable. The, the commitment uh, and the dedication 
And, and I think because for all of our students, uh, it's personal. Um, and you know, they understand that this is an important set of issues that's going to shape their own lives. And, um, and so for you know, anybody who's thinking of integrating gender into their courses or teaching a gender course, I think you will find you know, an extremely receptive and enthusiastic audience from your students. I think students are eager to learn as much as they can about these issues. And yeah, I, I think it's important for us to remember as teachers that one of our responsibilities is to help educate our students and prepare them for the lives they're going to lead over the next 50 years. And that means we can't be uh, too deeply attached to the theoretical and intellectual frameworks of the past 50 years. We have to think about what our students need to know. Uh, this is something they need to know and it's something they want to know. And uh, they're very eager to learn um, more about it. And so uh, I, I was you know, just thrilled to have such a great group of students last semester and again this semester. So let, let me ask you about your experience teaching gender courses. You've been, uh, you have a broader experience with this and you have a broader comparative basis for, uh, for thinking about it. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I, yes, um, students are always very engaged in these, um, in these courses because like you say, it is personal uh, as well as political as the good old feminist slogan goes. And so um, I think that 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 means that there is a, a very deep investment in terms of connecting with the materials and the overall kind of focus uh, of these courses. The way I approach it, there's one exercise I always do at the beginning of each of my courses, and some of you who are my students listening today will remember this exercise, but it's an intersectionality awareness tool and essentially I ask all my students to reflect on their own power and privilege and also how this has shifted over time historically in the course of their own lives and depending on where they are situated they may have moved from different parts of the US from rural to urban from different parts of the world and um, perhaps from the global south to the global north and just thinking about where you know their own power and pri privilege in relation to gender obviously race ethnicity religion and um, disability ability um sexuality um so we, we 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 do this exercise early on in the process so that we can all really appreciate um this 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 concepts and constructs of gender and also the fluidity of gender and how our identities, our social identities shift over time and through space. So depending on where we are and what is happening in our lives, we may have more or less power of privilege. And this is a very a crucial starting point um, to begin thinking about intersectionalities and to begin looking at gender and gender theory and feminist theory and exploring these topics. So we really do start off with building blocks around understandings of femininities and masculinities, and then moving into um, obviously feminist theoretical frameworks, but also the policy agenda, you know, so for example, the women, peace and security agenda that we've already spoken about and both of us are very um, passionate about um, in terms of our work within that framework, but also um, international human rights uh, treaties, for example, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. That's a mouthful, CEDAW, as it's alternatively known, um, and the Beijing Platform for Action, and also the Sustainable Development Goals. And looking at these different policy frameworks, looking through them, and considering um, gender, where, you know, how gender is understood within this policy making machinery, and where are the gaps, and where do we need to conduct more research and develop new policy? And then how do we advocate 
on behalf of these transformative um, policy developments. So these are some of the ways um, that I approach teaching in the classroom. But um, yes, I, I, I really resonate with what you're saying in terms of the excitement and the passion of the students um, is really key to um, how these courses are taught. And I think another, um, just another little thing to mention, uh, Gia, um, we call the Gender Equality Initiative and in International Affairs Gia, just in case anybody isn't aware of that. And in spring last year, we conducted a survey of current students and former students, and we asked them about their experience of GIA. And it was really, it was really wonderful to see that 90% um, of all students said they found going through the program was personally empowering for them, that it actually really supported them in terms of their, obviously their capacity building around the knowledge of the, of the field, but also their own confidence in terms of um, the work that they do and they want to do and they aspire to do, but also their role within the field. So um, that was um, obviously important um, piece of research and important for us to know about the program. That doesn't mean we haven't got lots to learn and improvements to make. Of course we do. And I'm very keen to hear and open to hear um, hear about all of that. But um, but just reflecting what you said, Mike, in terms of, yes, this is personal. Um, and, and so that obviously adds to the way that the courses are approached by our students. So. This is, I think, going to be our very last question between the two of us, but and then we'll open it up. Um, so in terms of our colleagues, other faculty um, bringing gender into their own syllabi, you know, maybe if they haven't ever done that before and it just feels like a sort of a, you know, a lot of, you know, information. It could be a bit of a fog in terms of, okay, I've never brought this in. How do I even start about bringing in these readings and, and this other framework into my course topic? What, what thoughts do you have, Mike? Because you've, you've been doing this and, um, and, and, you know, I'm really interested to hear what your idea is around how best to approach it. Well, I, I think from a, a faculty standpoint, there, there might be two groups of faculty who would react to all of this. And the first group would be the folks who really don't want to include gender in their courses. Maybe it's because they're attached to a certain way of thinking about issues and teaching these issues. And, and for those colleagues, I guess I would just urge them to remember that our fundamental goal here is to advance understanding of international affairs as scholars. We need to think about all of the frameworks and lenses that will help us do that. And I've come to think of gender not as a topic, although it is a topic, but not just as a topic, but a lens and as a paradigm for understanding international affairs and human affairs. And so as scholars, I think we need to use this lens to understand the issues that we want to understand uh, and again i think to have it in our courses to help prepare our students for the lives they're going to live over the next 50 years and then i think there's another group of colleagues who would maybe want to include gender in their courses but they're nervous about doing that because it's not a set of issues they've read a lot about or studied and I guess what I would say to that group of colleagues is don't be intimidated. Um, we all teach topics that are outside of our research areas. I mean, all of us. I mean, when I first started to teach, department chair asked me what I wanted to teach. I said, well, I could teach a course on nuclear weapons. And he said, what else? I said, nuclear arms control. And he said, what else? I said, nuclear strategy. And he said, is there anything else in your repertoire? I could do nuclear arms racing. And he said, well, we'd like you to teach a course on US foreign policy, intro to international affairs, politics of the Middle East, and we'll let you teach one arms control course. Uh, we all teach courses and topics that are outside of our main area. And especially for those of us who are teaching the survey courses, the core courses, the cornerstone courses, 
we teach a lot of topics that are out of area for us. And when I first started to teach the Intro to International Affairs course for freshmen, I had to give lectures on poverty and development for the first time in my life, uh, climate change and environmental issues, and a lot of topics that I had read about but had never taught before. And we all know how to do this. I mean, we all know how to get our arms around a topic and to outline it. And I, I think there's actually something to be said for folks like us to come into a topic new because we're going to be framing things in ways that are useful to students. And you know, I'm often telling students, here's how I try to think about this subject. This is how I define the scope of the topic. These are the main elements within it. And by trying to convey my own process for thinking about the issues, I'm hoping that I'm you know, conveying that to the students as well. And you know, this issue, like all the other issues we study in international affairs, is something that I think all of us are capable of getting our arms around and teaching. It requires a bit of reading and a bit of thinking, uh, but it's you know within our intellectual capacities to do that. And I think that's true in political science, economics, history, anthropology, public uh, administration, geography. Uh, gender should be integrated into all these disciplines and hopefully into all of our core courses as as well. And so, you know, I I. I I know this sounds a bit Orwellian because Orwell actually wrote, you know, ignorance is strength and I'm, I'm, I'm not glorifying ignorance, but there's something to be said uh, to coming to a set of issues with a fresh outlook and framing things in ways that are useful to beginners, uh, someone like me who's relatively new to the field. And I think those frameworks can be useful to students. and. Um, I read this one story by Laura Schoberg, who of course is a great scholar on gender and security issues. And she tells the story of how she taught her first gender and politics course on her own. And a student came up, uh, asked a question during class, what is gender? And she said she was stuck. She knew how to write a 200 page essay on the topic, but she didn't know how to answer it succinctly. I could not write a 200 page essay on the topic, but I do have a PowerPoint slide on it. And, um, and the one slide is something that's useful to the students. And I think those of us who are new to a topic can bring that perspective and that structure, but also the enthusiasm. I mean, I'm enthusiastic about the subject just because it's a new area for me and I learn something new every day and in every class. So, what, what advice would you give to? people who are thinking of adding gender into their courses? Well, I'm going to advise that they take a look at the GIA Gender Analysis Toolkit. So we recently created this toolkit, and I think Ariane is going to put the link in the chat box now. Brilliant. Thank you, Ariane. That was super quick. Um, so we have this toolkit that ever, anybody can access. And it gives you information on a number of different um, topics. So, for example, it has all the definitions, you know, around gender, gender based violence, gender analysis, gender mainstreaming, all these terms which you um, may have heard of or may, maybe haven't, but it gives you all of these types of definitions. It also includes readings on um, such topics as feminist foreign policy. So this is an exciting newish area in terms of um, this whole field. And so readings on feminist foreign policy frameworks, um, critiques of opportunities for developing feminist foreign policy approaches by um, the US government or other governments, um, looking at gender and development, looking at the sustainable development goals, obviously, um, considering gender and peace and security. So looking at issues um, and subtopics within all of this, such as um, LGBTQI populations and understandings of peace and security, 
also engaging men and boys and understandings of masculinities and um, you know engaging men in terms of gender equality issues in international security. So all of these are also included within the toolkit. Now it is it's an organic like it's we're, we're developing it, we're working on it at the moment. In fact, I can see one of our students, AP Valesco is here at the moment and she is um, a senior. An undergraduate senior who is currently developing this gender analysis toolkit for GIA and we're going to be adding podcasts, webinars, TED talks, you know, obviously books and uh, uh, peer review journal articles. Um, and for example, this particular event that's been recorded, that's going to be added so that anybody in the future who's just interested in hearing this conversation can can do so or share it with their students or their or their classes so i would encourage you to take a look at that and also feel free to share any resources that you have been using in your classrooms that you think we should include in this gender analysis toolkit um because obviously we're, we're keen you know here as a learning community to share best practice and to share new ideas so with that, um, we're going to open it up now and see if you have any questions about any of the topics that we've been discussing here today or any others that we haven't that you wish to discuss. Um, so feel free to put a question in the chat or to um, just raise your hand and you can unmute yourselves. We've deliberately created this as an event where everybody is a panelist so that we can talk directly to each other. So um, I'll just give you a moment to think about any question you may you may have. And I can see AP. AP, do you want to talk briefly about your work on the Gender Analysis Toolkit? Thank you, AP. So are there any other um, thoughts, comments, questions, any other ideas in terms of um, you know, best practice in terms of teaching gender and international affairs? I'd be interested in hearing any any of those ideas or any other questions see you there for a moment um sorry I, mike do you want to kick off yeah courtney thanks for that and um i mean we all agree it's important and i i think gw and the elliott school are you know places that are especially good at it i think it's it's um you know, pretty much hardwired into our way of thinking about, um, you know, the issues that we want to study and you know, the Elliott School, and I know you're, you're at uh, GSHED, I mean, you know, these are multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary schools. Um, you know, I, I think as teachers, we need to be thinking about this in terms of our courses and our readings. And, you know, in terms of our scholarship I, I think really just requires you know making a conscious effort to reach out to people who are not necessarily on our you know top 10 list of people that we think about to think more broadly about who should be included and um uh and again i think you know the Elliott school is a place that prioritizes that and you know, events like this are also terrific in terms of reaching out to wide ranges of people. I think we just have to be you know, mindful on a day-to-day -day basis, but also when we're putting projects together or syllabi together, that we need to be thinking in multidisciplinary and cross-disciplinary terms. And, you know, just remind ourselves and others that this should be a priority and that it becomes mainstreamed. And, and it becomes more prominent and more prevalent. And, and to follow up on that, um, Courtney, thank you for your question. Um, also, just to let you know that we've recently created a um, student consortium on women, peace and security, and we're launching it next Tuesday on the 9th of March, day after International Women's Day. And within that particular conference that we're having on the 9th of March, it's an all day event, we're going to be having um, four parallel workshops. And one of those is on historical trauma and its gendered effects. 
And so this is obviously bringing in, you know, other disciplines um, into, into this field. But also what we are planning to do with the consortium more broadly, and one of the things students said in particular that they wanted was to engage across disciplines on this topic and to work, obviously, um, you know, with different schools and, and universities. And we've invited 18, the 18 DC consortium universities into this uh, process. Um, and like I said, we're launching it next Tuesday. So it's a little, you know, we're, we're working in that direction. It's a movement towards that in terms of this one particular project. And actually, I'm going to put the Eventbrite link up in the chat box now in a moment as well for anybody who's interested. And I think, oh, Ariane is already, Ariane has already done it. So that's fantastic. Thank you, Ariane. So I see there's another question, Manoush. Hi, all. Um, my name Manoush, is Manoush. I just want to congratulate you because that's a really important research project. And I'm delighted that you are conducting this research and I'd love to see it <laughs> as well. I'm really curious to, to see the outputs from that particular research project. I suppose in terms of, um, you know, thinking through your question, uh, well, one thing that is that comes to mind is the fact that we at the Elliott School have recently created an inclusive teaching policy that speaks exactly to the, you know, your question, your broader question. And in this inclusive teaching policy, we are, you know, um, asking, obviously, all our faculty to bring in these criteria that you're studying. So to be cognizant of you know, which readings, which authors, um, from which contexts, um, you know, are represented in the syllabi so that there is a diversity across um, the content and that there is inclusion in terms of, you know, who are we talking about, which populations, which groups of people, which groups are marginalized or silenced and which ones do we need to bring in. So um, I, I'm not going to reference a particular piece of research around that that you need to look at, but I'm sure somebody on this call will have will have that or will be able to forward it on to you. Um, but I think that process in terms of the school thinking through um, you know, what, what we're teaching and whose voices are being heard is obviously crucial to being able to and broaden out our understandings of international affairs and bringing in multiple perspectives. Mike, is there anything that you wanted to add on that? Well, I, I want to um, say that this is a, a terrific initiative. And it, one of the things that feminist and gender scholars talk about all the time is the need for more data on what's going on. It's a huge issue at every level, at the United Nations, at the national level, and within the academy, just collecting data on what's going on is hugely important. And we don't have nearly enough you know, situational awareness, as we say in security studies, uh, of just where things currently stand. And so in terms of what's being taught in courses, collecting syllabi and coding them, is a terrific initiative and you know having that baseline is essential if we're going to make pro progress and measure progress and determine whether or not we're getting closer to our goals um, i don't know if the chronicle of higher education or inside higher education two of the leading academic journals have done anything like this but if they haven't they should and that might be one place to look to see what else has been done. And of course, you know, programs like Shirley's uh, are often doing this kind of thing as well. And, and I see there was a question from a, a student in the chat box about what can students do uh, in terms of encouraging professors to integrate gender more into their courses. Well, I think it's important for you to speak up and um you know and 
not just to professors, but I, I think you know, without um, you know, engaging in ad hominem attacks, I think it's possible to raise these issues with department chairs and program directors and associate deans and deans and people around the university at the provost's office uh, to make sure that they are aware that students consider this to be a priority. Um, and ask questions like, you know, just how are we doing in terms of integrating gender into courses? What information does the provost have on how this is being done? Um, it would be good for the university to collect this information and to share it with the broader community so we can figure out how we're doing and how we could do better. And I, I think on that, um, just following up, um, AP, who we all heard spoke a moment ago, is shortly going to conduct a mapping exercise, just having a, a look at um, core courses in the Elliott School and considering whether you know these terms around diversity, equity, and inclusion are also you know how often they're being included in the readings and in the syllabi of our faculty, just to give us an overview so that we have more of an understanding of you know um, the, the teaching of gender within the Elliott School, so that we have a have a baseline of sorts. And that from that baseline, then we can support our faculty, we can support each other to increase um, increase that content where it, it is desired. So um, just to make that point as well, uh, we're at the beginning of that process. And so definitely um, that is something that we will be happy to share later in the semester. So are there any other questions or comments um, before we move on? Anybody else? I see a number of former students here. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'm not going to <laughs> say your names specifically, but I'd love to hear any comments or thoughts from former or current students or anybody on the call. Any reflections? And this one over to Mike, but because I teach gender, <laughs> so the person wouldn't be in my class <laughs> if they weren't <laughs> interested in gender. Um, so I haven't had, I suppose that is one of the, you know, wonderful benefits of teaching um, gender and international affairs is the fact that everybody is there because they really want to be and they're very interested in the topic. But um, Mike, did you have any problems like this ever? It's not a major problem. It's it, it's a great question. And so, you know, as I said earlier, I've I've been teaching some of the introductory survey courses at the Elliott School at the undergraduate level and at the MA level. And um, you know, those students have not, you know, opted into a gender course. They're taking a survey course uh, because it's a required course and um, you know, they don't have any way out of it and you know i mean professors can tell um when students are engaged in this subject and when they're not and um and when i've been teaching these survey courses i mean i can tell that sometimes there is five ten maybe twenty percent of the class that's just not interested really in listening to me talk about gender issues, um, mainly men, but also some women, um, you know, folks who really, really want me to get to nuclear weapons or whatever it is they're really interested in. And, uh, you know, the point I try to make is that this is an essential lens for looking at everything. <clears throat> you know, even my, you know, original field, you know, nuclear weapons. I mean, you really cannot understand security issues, arms racing, crisis management without understanding gender issues. And, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that masculinity issues could be a real problem in a crisis. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons why people were quite concerned about what we call the Korean Missile Crisis 
in 2017, 2018, because the two main protagonists were Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. And so, th yeah, that's, that's a real concern. Um, so you know, I just try to convey to students that this is something that is important for them to understand and will be helpful to them in understanding the issues they care about. And I, I think, you know, most, a lot of students come around and some don't, and that's okay. Um, you know, maybe it's something that will come back to them five or 10 years from now and they'll say, oh yeah, I had this professor at the Elliott School who kept talking about gender and now I get it. Maybe it'll sink in later on. Um, one thing I have noticed though among our students is that, um, and I, I think we're fortunate because we're at GW and we're at the Elliott School, uh, we have terrific students and um, you know, with very, very few exceptions, I find that our students are uh, extremely respectful and considerate and attentive of each other. Um, there are a few bad apples, but this is a case where they're really, I think where the bad apples analogy actually applies. Uh, I, I find that you know, student interactions on issues in general, but especially on gender issues, uh, tend to be exceedingly respectful and attentive, which is the way it should be on every issue. But I find in my gender courses in particular, um, students are very sophisticated um, intellectually and emotionally in how they interact with others on, on these issues. And that makes for a very positive teaching environment. And I, I will, um, you know, I, I agree with everything um, that Dr. Brown has just said. And I see there's another question in the chat box from Kelsey Rasband. How can we get our male friends and colleagues to take gender and gender issues seriously? Many of them think that gender issues aren't a real, a real subject or are silly. Um, yeah, and thank you for that question, Kelsey. That goes back to what I was saying at the beginning uh, of this um, conversation. I think it's important, um, as Dr. Brown also made clear earlier, that we don't conflate gender with women, that we are looking at gender power relations. We're looking at how gender in any given society impacts the roles that women and men play, their access to resources and rights and what that, and what that means. And so, for example, we created a course, Masculinities and International Affairs, that was taught for the first time last semester, full semester, um, by Lakshman Belbasi, and also um, supported by a graduate a student, Nicholas Zorowski. Um, and that course we created specifically with the intention of broadening out understandings and awareness within the Elliott School, that gender is about men and masculinities, as well as about women and femininities, and inclusivity of gender and sexual minorities. So that was a, that was a step in the right direction. But I think we need to, you know, go back to your question, if we have gender, brought into more courses as part of, you know, part of the syllabi of um, different courses across the school, then we bring in um, new and different understandings around those topics through a gender lens. And so, for example, if we look at the Valerie Hudson book that was mentioned earlier, the first political order that was um, published last year, and she talks about, for example, how men fighting over the fact that they cannot, they don't have bride price in particular countries, and how um, if certain groups of men cannot afford to marry because they don't have bride price because of the inequalities between tribes, um, that, that those sorts of in intra-country uh, conflicts can spill over the borders into the wider region and can turn into um, larger protracted conflicts. So just as, you know, I think these understandings, like uh, Dr. Brown was saying, 
of the role of masculinities and how mis masculinities are performed within international affairs and what that means in terms of conflict, peace and security, then that whole conversation uh, needs to be broadened out and needs to be included within the school. So um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Brown, do you have any other comment on that particular question? Yeah, it, it, it's a key issue. Um, and, and that is, um, you know, profile raising and awareness raising and mainstreaming the issue. And I, I think we have to be mindful that this is going to be a long term campaign. It's not something that's going to be measured in terms of months or years, but decades and generations. Uh, it's frustrating to think that way, but you know, as Valerie Hudson points out, this is the first political order. It's also the longest lasting political order. It's literally been around since the dawn of humanity, you know, for many, many thousands of years. It's a political order that's fundamental, it's pervasive, it affects every aspect of human affairs. It's going to take a very long time to change. And it's going to take a very long time to get men to recognize that this is an important issue, um, not just for women and girls, but for everybody. It's, it's a fundamental issue for humanity. And I think it's fundamentally important for men to emphasize just how central they are to the problem. And it's always hard for people to say that we are at the heart of the problem, but we're talking about men, masculinity, and patriarchies. And women are also important in perpetuating all of this, but men are really central to it. And one of my favorite sayings of all time comes from a cartoonist, Walt Kelly, who wrote in 1970 um, for the first Earth Day, which was marked in 1970, uh, he, he said, we have met the enemy and he is us. And he was talking about pollution and the environment and you could now apply it to climate change as well. We have met the enemy and he is us. We have, we're responsible for the problem. Um, I, I actually think it's a good title for this book that Chantal and I are working on, on men and masculinities because I think men need to keep hearing the message, and it's good if they hear it from men. But we have met the enemy, and he is us. I mean, we are the problem. I mean, we have to come to terms with the impact of the ideology of male supremacy. And men, more than anyone else, are responsible for perpetuating and benefiting from this. And we have to do something about this. Um, I mean, we're not just part of the picture, we are at the heart of the problem. Um, and all these other issues that we're talking about in terms of the different implications and manifestations of this won't be addressed until men start to face up to our role in all of this. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And I think we're going to, there's one more question that I'm going to respond to now in a moment, but I think we're, we're pretty much going to wrap it up now. Um, and just just to follow on from what you were saying, you know, it, it was it was very interesting for me as well to hear um, women students, and and nobody's going to be surprised to hear that the majority of the students in um, my gender courses are women. Um, although we we do have men, which is fantastic in those courses as well. Um, sometimes as many as three or four men in a class of 20. So the numbers are increasing, which is wonderful. But also I've heard from other courses, not gender courses, where, where there's male dominated classrooms, where women students sometimes do get spoken over or they feel silenced or they just feel like their contributions are not valued as much within those male dominated environments. And I think that is a problem. <laughs> and that is something we are, you know, looking into and we are um, addressing. And, and that is part of the inclusive teaching policy of the Elliott School, is this awareness around equity of voice in the classroom and how important this is for the learning process. This is a learning environment. We want everyone to feel that they can engage in discussion and that they're, you know, that they're able to, they're encouraged to, and that they are given the space to do that. But I see there's another question here, and I might pronounce your name incorrectly, Thule Sile. 
Um, um, so Tulasili, thank you for your question, asking about as the emphasis on gender rises at D GW, how much emphasis is being placed on the intersection between race and gender? And this is a great question, and thank you for that. And and to say that yes, um, that we are we are emphasising this intersection. There have been a number of events in the past year, um, webinars and panels specifically focused on gender and race and international affairs. They've all been recorded, so I know you can find them um, on the Diver Diversity and Inclusion Council webpage. They are there. And also to let you know, in this mapping exercise that I mentioned earlier, where we're looking, you know, across syllabi to get an understanding for, you know, how gender is um, being taught in the Elliott School, we're also looking for race and we're also looking at other, um, you know, categories within diversity and equity and inclusion. Just so just to reassure you of that too. So. I think we have come to the end of what has been a really um, enjoyable conversation for me. <laughs> and I hope for all of you who have been listening and participating. Thank you all so much um, for taking time out of your busy day to join us today. And thank you, Dr. Brown, for um, having this conversation with me today. It's been wonderful. And also, I'd like to thank Ariane Son, who is the GIA program assistant and who made all of this possible um, with her technical wizardry um, and also sending out all the marketing materials. So I just want to thank you all so much again for participating. Do sign up and come to our launch event on the 9th of March of the Women, Peace and Security Consortium. Um, and please come to other events that we're having and join us in the classroom and let you be the judge of how well we're teaching gender and international affairs and what we need to do to improve. So thank you all so much and uh, see you next time.